Great, so how is everyone doing today? Pretty well, thanks for coming. So just out of curiosity, has anyone in the room ever seen their pictures used without permission before? You know someone? That's good. Anyone know anyone? You? Huh? <laughs> it seems like everyone, they either has happened to them or they know someone. Um, at Pixie, which I'm going to describe in a moment, <laughs> we've heard all kinds of stories. Uh, we've heard from, for example, a photographer who licensed his work to one magazine and then found it later on in five magazines. Uh, I actually spoke to someone last week and his friend was coming home from vacation and said, oh, hey, I saw your photo on the airplane. <laughs> his photo had actually been used on an in-flight entertainment system. And this is one of my favorites from a painter. And he found his work on coffee packaging. Uh, well, no, 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 that's, that's my byline. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can take a look. It's actually gluten-free if anyone's looking for gluten-free coffee. Um, so yeah, it seems like image theft is a really common occurrence. Uh, I'm actually a photographer myself and an entrepreneur, and after experiencing this problem many times, I had the idea to create Pixie a year and a half ago. Uh, I also took a course on copyright through Harvard Law School's Copyright X program, which has given me a really strong background in copyrights. Uh, so I can see it both from a little bit of the legal perspective, the business perspective, and the photography perspective. What I wanted to talk to you guys today about is what do you do when you find your photo stolen or you think you may have found your photo stolen? Uh, a lot of photographers, they don't really expect something like this to happen, and then they hear about it. This happened to me when I was starting out as a photographer. Someone said, oh, Daniel, I saw your picture in such and such a place on the internet, and I had no clue what to do. So it may not have happened yet. It might not ever happen, but it's definitely something you should think about. Uh, so we're going to talk about four different things. First of all, how to track your photos online and discover where they're being used. Uh, and then we're going to get into determining if a use was unauthorized or not. That might seem really straightforward, but there's a lot of situations on the internet where something might actually be authorized without you realizing it. Uh, and then we're going to go into the fun part, playing detective and then investigating, okay, I found my photo, let's document the evidence. And we're going to talk a little bit about how to find other uses as well that may have occurred in addition to what you found. And then we're going to take a look at different options you have for taking action. If you guys have a question at any point in time, we can definitely stop and take a closer look. Uh, we've got a really great group here today, and I really want this to be more of a one-on-one. -on -one. So just let me know if you have any questions. So tracking your work online. There's a lot of different ways to do this. Has anyone used Google Images or Tenai? Great, great. Yeah, I think Bing also has a reverse image search tool. These are really useful tools if you want to search one picture. Uh, with Pixie, what we do is we have a platform where you can import your work from Smug Mug, Photo Shelter, Flickr, Instagram, your own website, and other platforms. And then we search the entire internet for copies of these pictures. And we continuously look for new copies. So here's an example of our online interface here. You import the photos, and then you're shown a matches page. And you can go through and say, OK, I authorized this. No, I didn't. Uh, we also let you send takedown notices to certain social media websites. So it's a really great tool if you just want to know where your work is being used online. Uh, photographers tell me it's a lot of fun. A friend came to me actually recently, and he took a photo of a friend, and I, I think that she's about 23 years old, and she was in an Italian news article about what to do when you get old. <laughs> Wasn't very happy about that, but it was pretty funny. Uh, this is an example of a use we recently found on Pixie. It was a single picture used four different times on a Latin American news website. So these are the kinds of things. It's just an example of what our tool can pick up. 
So let's say that you're going through Pixie and maybe you find your work used by a travel agency. How many of you in here are working with stock photo agencies? OK, that's good. Uh, a lot of photographers are working with micro stock agencies, and this is great, but it can be really difficult because they often sublicense the work, or they often will sometimes sell it and not give you a full report of where it ended up. So the first thing that we do is we talk to photographers is if they've been working with stock photo agencies, double check if the, photo, if the agency licensed the photo. Uh, oftentimes that can happen without you realizing it. And of course, before you go and accuse a company of using your photo, you want to make sure that wasn't the case. Your agency will appreciate it. Uh, another thing to be really careful of is don't enter your photo in online contest. There are some exceptions here. But oftentimes, actually, I almost entered one once with an airline where you could just upload your photo and win a chance for, I think it was 100,000 airline miles. And I thought, great, I'll go to Hawaii. And then I read the terms and conditions, and it let the airline use the photo in any future marketing campaign. Um, so maybe if you enter a photo contest, just give them you know, a 100 pixel version or something really small. But otherwise, uh, I don't recommend it. Um, and also, we've seen sometimes photographers, they just simply gave someone permission maybe 10 years ago and they forgot. So it's always great just to double check on that end. And how many of you have taken a picture of a national park, the Eiffel Tower, a concert? Everyone, right? Uh, one thing that people forget is everyone else is standing in the same spot. If you actually go to Google and search for photographers in Antelope Canyon, everyone is standing in the same spot taking pictures. So if you have a picture of a landmark, you really want to double check, look at close detail, and make sure that it is, in fact, your photo. Uh, we actually work with a photographer, and he had thought that a major news site had used his photograph. And it turns out that the first friend next to him at the concert took exactly the same photo uh, and sold it. So always double check these things if you're taking photos of common things. And then also, most countries have some sort of fair use doctrine that allows for limited use of a copyrighted work. For example, educational use in a student presentation. If the picture is a much smaller part of something bigger, if you have a group of thumbnails, for example. Uh, or let's say, for example, you happen to be so lucky to sell your photo for $100 million, and there's a news report about this, that use of the photo may fall under fair use. From there, if you've identified that the use is most likely unauthorized, the most important thing you can do is capture as much evidence as you can immediately. If you're on a Mac, it's Control, actually, no, Command Shift 3. Just take a screenshot, and it will give you a time stamped screenshot. It's also really great if you just print out a PDF copy of the web page. Uh, and the really great thing about Pixie is once you submit a use to us, we'll actually automatically capture a screenshot of that use. It's always great to take your own as well. Uh, but really, just it sounds really straightforward. But just go take those screenshots as quickly as possible. Make a backup. Make sure that you have that. Uh, and this is really important. If you find your photo used in one place, for example, let's say that you find it in one news article, there's a decent likelihood that it's been used in other places. So if you're ever in that position that you find your photo stolen, you want to think like a detective. OK, if they used it in this article about airplanes, what other airplane articles does this publication have? If it was used in a corporate presentation, how can I find other copies of that company's presentation? Uh, for example, quite often we see that if a magazine uses something on their blog, they use it elsewhere. So if you find that this happens to you, definitely go order back copies of the magazine. Or a lot of publications now put copies online. Check that out. You can also search in Google Books. Uh, for keywords, a lot of times, publishers will also have things in Google Books. Do a lot of searching around. Sign up for an email newsletter. Uh, same thing with the corporate presentation. Oftentimes, they're repeated elsewhere in the corporation. Uh, if something's in an image database, it can go anywhere. 
So it's really important that before you do everything, you document every single potential use. This is actually a really funny example. This is a photo from one of our photographers, Harold Davis. And the beautiful taxi and the beautiful airplane have been photoshopped in. And this came in to us. And you might not be able to see it from back there, but we looked really carefully. And if you look at the door on the taxi, the picture is also on the side of the taxi. <laughs> so, you know, take a moment, get some tea, go for a walk, but really clear your mind and think about where else could this photo be. A lot of photographers just grab the first use they see and they run off with it, and they don't consider where else it can be. And later on, once you take action, you know, it can be a little more difficult to find these things. So the more work you do ahead of time, the better. And then from there, this is really the interesting part, uh, taking action and what do you do. So a lot of photographers will start off sending a takedown request. And this can be a really great way to resolve relatively straightforward, non-consequential uses. Like if someone uses your picture on a forum, or a small blog, or a Facebook page, and you'd rather not have it there, sending a DMCA takedown, or sending just a polite request, or maybe asking for credits, that's a really great way to do it. Uh, sometimes photographers think that they need to send a takedown, and if the takedown is not respected, then they can take action. That's the way it works, and it's actually not the case. You don't need to start off with a takedown, and that can actually hurt you because if you find, for example, a company using the photo and you send a takedown, then they think that taking down the photo <coughs> resolves the issue. And that, that's not the case. So don't let anyone tell you that. Um, invoices. A lot of photographers like to send invoices. And we see this really often at Pixie. Uh, it can be great to send an invoice, especially if it's a really reliable repeat client, someone you do business with. Or maybe it's just a really small mom and pop store and you just want to resolve it very quickly. That can be an option for you. Uh, but often we find that when photographers send invoices, two things happen. First thing is that the company doesn't take it seriously. They say, OK, well, who is this Joe Blow in Wyoming? Let's throw this in the trash can. Uh, the other thing that happens is oftentimes photographers undervalue how much they can ask for. Uh, that's really important because if the company doesn't pay your invoice, then you've already started off with what could potentially be a really low offer. And whenever you're negotiating, you don't want to do that. It's, a lot of this also is just simple business negotiation. Uh, what we really recommend that you do is if you're using Pixie and you find something, is if you have your own attorney, you bring it to your attorney, you say, this is what I found, and you get their advice. Uh, and you can also send it to Pixie. We have our own licensing team, and we also work with a team of law firms around the world. So if you find something in Denmark, or in Germany, or in Canada, or in the US, you can just send that to us, and then we'll send it to our law firm to look over. And the great thing is, you really want a lawyer to send a letter for you, because they do this all the time. They're the professionals. Uh, just like if you're getting... Um, your, your teeth cleaned, are you going to the doctor? You have a professional do that. Uh, I don't have my best friend take my appendix out. <laughs> uh, so I really recommend it. And also, an attorney will be taken much more seriously. And then, you know, just sending in a, a lot of photographers, they want to be, they're really nice people, and they don't want to be mean about it. And I can definitely understand that. No one wants to spend their entire day dealing with legal stuff. Uh, I think law offices are really boring. But your lawyer doesn't have to be mean and nasty. You just need to send a letter clearly explaining the situation and what you're looking for. And you'll probably have a much better outcome than if you send an invoice or a takedown on your own. With that in mind, uh, this is, I think, what every single photographer wants to know when they find their photo used. And if they decide that they want compensation, is what can you ask for and how much can you ask for? Naturally, the first thing that comes to people's mind is lost licensing revenue or profits. So
So if you normally sell your photo for a certain amount, that's definitely one thing that you can ask for. Uh, in many situations, you might be able to ask for lost profits. For example, if you see that this photo was printed on 1,000 mugs, OK, what is the profit from that? Um, one thing that some photographers and lawyers don't consider is what is the loss of the picture's value? I'll give you an example. Let's go back to a corporate report. Let's say that a company uses my picture in their next quarterly report. Really nice of them, great, they like my work. Uh, but then how many companies want to use something that another company has used in such a prominent location? Uh, not only has my picture been used in that report and I've lo lost that licensing revenue, but I've also lost the ability to go to another company and offer them exclusive use for that work. So definitely consider the loss of the picture's value. It could also be, for example, let's just say you do fine art photography and you had never considered selling your work commercially, it would never sell it commercially. Uh, if it's on the home page of a big company, that reduces its value as a fine art piece. And that's something that you should also take into consideration. Uh, we were talking earlier about copyright registration over here. And in the United States, if you register your work with the Copyright Office, you become eligible to claim $750 to $30,000. And in some cases, you can also get your attorney fees back. So that's a really great tool. Um, most of these issues are resolved without going to court. And just simply having a registration is a really, really great thing in your benefits. You can register up to 750 published photos in one registration. So you can actually do this in bulk for, I think, just $55. And I always recommend that photographers make this part of their workflow. Uh, we can also help with registration at Pixie if you ask us. Uh, and another key thing is if you have metadata inside your photo that was removed or if you have a watermark that was removed or added, sometimes actually you'll find watermarks were added to the photo, um, there's actually a law in the US where you can claim $2,500 to $25,000. Um, and what our attorneys always emphasize to us is that it's really important to show that it was deliberate. So a lot of photographers use metadata in their photos, uh, and that can be problematic. For example, I've seen on Flickr, if you download a smaller version of a photo, the metadata is already taken out. So a lot of times I see photographers, they say, well, these guys removed my metadata when it was removed somewhere else. So that's one thing to keep in mind, uh, but definitely uh, check to see if they removed your watermark because that's something that could be in your favor. Yeah, our, yeah, I guess let me explain EXIF data a little bit. So if you're in Photoshop or Lightroom, you can actually modify EXIF data. I can show you at the end of the presentation, actually, if you want to see this. Um, and you can say, for example, copyright 2016, Daniel Foster, all rights reserved. And this data theoretically stays with the photo everywhere it goes. But a lot of photo sharing sites and social media sites will just take this out when you upload it. Um, so it's important to look if you find the picture stolen that to see if the image user possibly took this out. But also keeping in mind that if you uploaded it to Facebook or Flickr, the data may have already been removed. So is it worth it to put it on your uh, Definitely, definitely. You can actually, like, I have a Lightroom action that automatically puts it in all of my photos. And a lot of newer cameras, uh, like my 5D Mark III, will automatically put the copyright metadata in the photo when I shoot it. Definitely, if anyone wants help with that at the end of the presentation, I can show you how to do it. But it's definitely worth it. Um, and I guess we can also, I think we have a bit of time, talk about different countries as well. Um, most of our photographers at Pixie are American photographers. And sometimes they say, oh, hey, why can't I get this in the UK? Or, hey, why can't I do this in Germany? And you always need to think about the laws outside the US if you're pursuing a foreign theft. Uh, usually what we found is that the amount of compensation that you can pursue in foreign countries is more limited than the US. But 
most countries have really great copyright protection, so we'll discuss a bit later. If you do find something that's not in the US, don't discount it. It's definitely worth looking into. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, a few quick things. You don't need to request a takedown before you can seek compensation. Uh, a lot of photographers, they see, oh, photo stolen, and then the next thing they think they're in a court or they're on judge duty or they have this long, drawn-out lawsuit in the back of their mind. And usually, it's really not that complicated. Uh, you can usually reach, in many cases, an agreement without going to court. Um, it's not going to drag on for the next 10 years. So keep, keep that in mind. A lot of photographers think it's really complicated, and usually it's not. And as I said, cases outside the United States usually are worth pursuing. So keep that in mind as well. At Pixie, we're currently pursuing matters in the US, Canada, Germany, the Netherlands, the UK, France, Australia, and I'm trying to think, oh yeah, Belgium and Luxembourg. Those are, the, I think I said Denmark as well. Um, we are always looking for new places to expand. There's some countries we found uh, aren't really worth going into. <laughs> Uh, this is actually uh, a work by photographer Brian McCarty. He's got a really great project called War Toys, and he travels around the world, and he takes local toys, and then he works with children, and then he creates these photographs where he recreates their war experiences with local toys. It's a really great, really great project, and he was really surprised. He sent me an email, and he said, Daniel, uh, ISIS stole my photo and put it on Twitter. <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we're not running around Syria with a clipboard. We can't go into Syria. <laughs> so we weren't able to help him in that regard. Um, a number of countries where we're currently not operating are China and Russia, many countries in South America, uh, and most of Africa. Uh, I think someday that might be possible. Uh, but one thing to always keep in mind is we can't change another country's legal system and we can't change the state of affairs in another country. So you can't chase everything. Uh, what we actually did do for Brian is we sent a number of takedown requests for him and the picture was removed from the internet. Uh, we haven't received any threats yet, so that's good. <laughs> uh, yeah, and this is really important. A lot of photographers, uh, not, a lot, not a lot, but many will go to Twitter or they'll go to Facebook and they'll say, oh, you stole my photo, add the company to the tweet, or they'll go to their Facebook page. And you know, it's really fun to share with your friends, oh, look what happened. But it's really important that you keep it confidential you know, until you've had a chance to gather everything, look at the situation. Uh, and yeah, sometimes, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of companies value confidentiality, and this is something that can give you leverage later. Uh, you know, if you've already told the whole world about what happened, this is something that they're no longer worried about. Uh, and I, I think more importantly, it gives them a chance to go, you know, then their marketing department sees this tweet and then they have a chance to go cover their tracks before you've gotten in touch with them. And I think also if you're working as a professional, uh, if I were hiring a photographer and I saw this on someone's Twitter feed, uh, you know, even though it's not their fault their photo was stolen, it doesn't look very professional, at least this kind of tweet. Uh, <laughs> Um, so let's take a look at what you can do to prevent your work from being used without permission online. One of the most important things you can do when working with clients is have a really clear agreement of how and when they can use your work. Uh, quite often we see that a lot of cases are un of unauthorized use are just because of a lack of agreements. For example, you sell a photo to one company and then they distribute it to a group of other countries and they didn't think that that was not allowed. And then there's a dispute between the photographer and the client 
and that's never great. So it's really important that you define exactly what type of use is allowed when you're doing a contract. So for example, you can say that this photo is for this specific use on this specific web page and this use only and define is social media use allowed, is use in other things allowed, is use in presentations allowed. Uh, I'm actually really surprised a lot of photographers have told me that they don't always use contracts. They do a handshake or they do word of mouth. Uh, and that just makes things needlessly complicated. You don't have to, when you're working with a client, you don't have to pull out a really big contract. A lot of times, just a simple even email agreement saying, this is the photo, this is how you can use it, this is how you can't use it. And if you want something else, ask me, this is how much it costs, please pay me by this date is sufficient. Uh, but yeah, please get as much as you can in writing. Uh, when your photo is published, whenever you can, always insist on attribution. Uh, this makes it much less likely that the use will be without permission. Uh, because if you see a photo, especially on a corporate website, and there's no attribution, a lot of guys will think that the company owns the photo and just grab it. So whenever you can get attribution, that's really important. Uh, as I said earlier, register with the US Copyright Office. Uh, the great thing internationally is most countries are signatories to the Berne Convention. So uh, as a citizen of any of these countries, including the US, you get protection everywhere else in the world. So you don't need to worry about registering copyright in the UK or in Spain or in Australia. Uh, and you also don't have to register your work to receive copyright protection. That's also a common misconception. Copyright is automatic once you click the shutter. So don't worry so much about that. But if you do register your photo, as I said earlier, you're eligible for statutory damages of up to $30,000. Uh, and you actually need this as an American citizen to file a lawsuit in federal court. So a really sophisticated uh, photo stealer, and I don't like to use the word, but a really sophisticated company that's used a photo without permission will know that if there's no copyright registration that it can be a lot easier sometimes to get away. So do yourself the favor, make it part of your workflow to register. It's not the end of the world if you didn't, but it can really be in your favor if you do. And use tracking tools like Pixie, know where your work is on the internet, and that will help you out a great deal. Question? Yeah, what happens if you register after you've already found the image? Uh, that's okay, the rules for registration are quite long, so I definitely recommend you check with the copyright office and check with an attorney. But generally, you can, if the work's already been published, you have a three-month window to publish it. And then you have that statutory protection within that 90-day window. If it's, say, a year later, you can still register the work, but you'll only be eligible for statutory damages for uses of the picture after that date. So if you've never registered your photos, you can definitely do it now, and you'll have that protection going forward. But any use for th before that, uh, would not be covered. Uh, from there, actually, yeah. <laughs> These are some things to keep in mind as well. Uh, we actually, we've dealt with a number of unauthorized image uses at Pixie, and it's really amazing, you know, the same excuses come back again and again. Uh, one that we really like is that we wanted to give the photographer more exposure, and <laughs> This came from a company that didn't credit the photographer. <laughs> um, oftentimes, they'll say, I'm really sorry, and they'll offer you something for free, like, would you like to come stay at our hotel? Would you like a magazine? Would you like this? Would you like that? Those things are really nice, uh, but the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that as a professional that you're compensated for the work that's been used. Um, I mean, I definitely would not hire someone to come fix my patio and then say, oh yeah, hey, you want to come have dinner and watch TV? <laughs> uh, you have to pay people for their work. A lot of companies will also say their intern did this. Uh, oftentimes the intern's also unpaid. Uh, and this is something that you should also really keep in mind. Uh, as I said earlier, if you have a repeat client and maybe by accident they use something without permission, it's really great 
talk to them, work it out on friendly terms. That's the best way to do it. Um, but if you've never worked with a company before and they say, oh, well, we'd love to hire you, be really careful with that. A lot of times they'll say, well, we shoot a lot of events and we'd love to have you come shoot our event next year or we'd like to have you do this or we'd love to have you do that. And it's always something a bit ambiguous in the future. Uh, and if you're a photographer looking for work and you're looking for exposure, it can be really tempting to take. But just say, that's great. I really appreciate your offer. Let's talk about this current work you've used and then we can talk about future work opportunities. That's really important. Um, let's see, we missed that. Yeah, so back to Pixie. Is anyone in here currently a Pixie member? No one? Okay, awesome. Uh, or actually, I can load our website for you. We're currently an invitation only service, mainly due to high demand. Uh, you can go to our website and you can sign up for an invitation code. Uh, but for all of you today, actually, I have invitation codes for you. So if you attend the event, you can actually skip the waiting list, come and sign up immediately. And we'd be very grateful and very honored to have you on our service.